structuring militancy at home and abroad. The fact that a member of the Panthic Committee that declared the independence of Khalistan is now residing in the United States, and that one of the initial instigators of the idea of Khalistan resides in London, Jagjit Singh Chauhan, shows the international character of the Sikh militant movement. Diaspora Sikhs have in fact been critical to the movement, and have become more so as the success of the counterinsurgency within Punjab becomes firmly established. This aspect of Sikh militancy creates both opportunities and difficulties for the researcher. Opportunities, because there is a community outside of India accessible to investigation, and living in conditions in which free exchange is possible. Difficulties however, because the transnational quality of Sikh militancy means that US, Canadian, and British citizens and residents, may have been involved in very serious criminal activities abroad, and contact with them, puts the researcher at least in the margins of these activities as well. There are security and intelligence questions here, not only from the viewpoint of India, but from the viewpoint of the Western countries that host diaspora Sikhs as well. A more immediate problem to be faced however, concerns the extreme factionalization of the militant community. Up until this chapter, I have basically been discussing the Sikh militancy as a unitary entity, however split up functionally into various forces and organizations. Alas for the movement, this picture is false. Infighting is in fact as characteristic of this movement, as is a certain external solidarity. Rifts between groups are expressed not only in vehement verbal arguments, but in physical disagreements, ranging from fist fights to shooting incidents. At the worst, they accuse each other of being agents of the Indian government, a serious charge indeed in a national liberation movement. This infighting discourages, not only temporary insiders like inquisitive anthropologists, but also seasoned Khalistani Sikhs. They all lament the state of affairs, but seem powerless to do anything about it. The original Panthic Committee, of which Dana Singh was a member, also included, Babagobachan Singh Manochal, Bhai Wasan Singh Zafar Wal, Bhai Arur Singh, and Bhai Gurdaf Singh Usman Wala. They were connected to the Damdami Taksal and were Orthodox Sikhs. After a Sarbat Khalsa, summoned by the Damdami Taksal on January 26, 1986, and conceived as a gathering of the entire community or Panth of Sikhs, these five were chosen to lead the struggle, that had in fact already begun during the months after the assassination of Indira Gandhi. Although Manochal was de facto head of the new Panthic Committee, it was conceived as a democratic committee of equals, in the Panch Piaris tradition. On April 29, 1986, the Panthic Committee called a press conference at the Golden Temple Complex, and presented the Declaration of Independence of Khalistan. It is a rather loosely written document, but it includes basic guarantees of democracy in the proposed state of Khalistan, as well as running through the litany of abuses suffered by Sikhs in the Indian state. All five members of the Panthic Committee were wanted by police at the time, so while the assembled journalists at the press conference were being served tea, the five members of the Panthic Committee changed into street clothes, and made their escape. The next day, the Golden Temple complex was invaded for the second time by Indian Army commandos, in an operation referred to as, Operation Black Thunder 1. Many Sikhs saw this as an attempt to justify the original Operation Blue Star, and the ruling Akali party led by Surjit Singh Barnala, was split by the issue. Many party members resigned in protest, and Barnala himself was declared Tankaya, or excommunicated by the Akal Takht, for his role in allowing this second sacrilege to happen. The Panthic Committee members remained in hiding after their initial pronouncement of Khalistan, participating in various elements of what was evolving into a full-blown guerrilla operation, until they were arrested, killed, or forced to flee the country. None of the members of the original Panthic Committee are alive in India today, three were killed and the other two now live in other countries. The Declaration of Independence of Khalistan, cites the Khalistan Commando Force, under the leadership of General Harry Singh, an alias of Bhai Manbir Singh Shahiru, after a Sikh hero of the Afghan wars, as the core of the Defence Force of Khalistan. The Khalistan Commando Force, 
KCF, was one of a handful of guerrilla organizations that sprang up after Operation Blue Star, a good number of its members being from the Maja region of Punjab, districts Amritsar and Gurdaspur. The Maja region, northeast of the Bias River, was historically known for its fierce and stubborn fighters. It is the site of Sikhism's holiest shrine, and is located on the Grand Trunk Road to Delhi. Flat and treeless like most of Punjab, the Majar zone is not an ideal setting for a guerrilla insurgency. From the beginning, militants who joined the Khalistan Commando Force, depended upon shelter from the people. The fact that Sikh militant organizations, have been able to sustain themselves in a territory as unsuited to insurgency as Punjab, has not received the attention it deserves. Although it is clear that shelter was sometimes given at gunpoint, all the classic theorists of guerrilla warfare agree, that an insurgent army simply cannot survive without substantial support from the general population. The guerrilla among his people like a fish in the water, and so on. Though the activists in the Sikh militancy are generally quite unaware, either of theories about guerrilla warfare, or of other guerrilla movements, with the exception of Kashmir, linked historically and strategically to the Punjab question, one interlocutor noted specifically the impact of Che Guevara on his thinking. I will tell you about my friend, who was always a very polite boy, who never fought with anybody or did anything wrong. He was a good student. After the Golden Temple event, he went into the movement. His family got upset and they were telling him to come home, as he was the only son. But he said, when you used to read in the paper about how brave the other boys were, you used to praise them, but now when it comes to your own house you start crying. I won't come home. Consider me as dead. The first action he got involved in was a very big action, in which eight police officers at a detective training academy were killed. The first gun he ever shot was an AK-47 in that raid. He and his comrades also pulled off an immense bank robbery, and a lot of the money was in his hands. But he didn't misuse a penny of it. He became in fact very pious and spiritual, as he became more involved in the movement. One time he gave me a book by Che Guevara to read, and that helped me understand what was going on with the militants. I used to wonder how they could survive, how they could succeed. But then I realized that there were other courageous people, standing up for the rights of minorities and poor people in other places too, and sometimes they managed to achieve those. The way my brave friend finally died, it was horrible. When his body was found, he had no teeth, no nails on his hands and feet, and his chest was entirely blackened. That was how he died. He was a skinny guy, only about 120 pounds, although he was 6 feet tall. But he had a lot of conviction. He died with his convictions. The continuing claim of Indian government sources, that the militants were extremists without a popular basis, was consistently belied by the ability of militants to hide underground for long periods of time. Despite claims of high numbers of militants killed, there were always more emerging from villages and towns across Punjab. But, as in the case with the estimation of the threat posed by Bindranwala in 1984, the Indian government could not concede widespread popular support, without turning what it saw as a law and order problem, into a full-blown political issue. Just as the actions of the Indian armed forces during Operation Blue Star, undercut the idea that the heart of the problem was a mere band of criminals, the weight of the government counterinsurgency, which fell on all and sundry in the state of Punjab, betrayed the notion that it was a few terrorists who were the problem. A substantial proportion of the population was the problem, despite rhetoric to the contrary. Though the fortunes of a number of guerrilla organizations have waxed and waned over the past 15 years, the militant movement overall has never lacked recruits. They were and are drawn primarily from young males, aged 15 to 25, although women may also join, and older individuals may also play key roles. There seems to be a general pattern of incorporation into a militant organization, in which an individual moves from providing shelter to militants, to carrying out subsidiary tasks like transporting weapons, to full-scale combat participation. Like all the guerrilla organizations, 
The KCF has a command structure with a general at the helm, lieutenant generals beneath him, followed by area commanders, and general cotters. But the extreme decentralization of the movement, means that the tight hierarchy implied by these titles, is often illusory. Local bands seem to frequently decide on missions quite independent of orders, or restraints from above, leading both to a certain resiliency in terms of the law, one cell doesn't know what another is up to, and to a tendency for general strategies on behalf of Khalistan, to turn into personal raids of vengeance on the local level. Already in 1978, Petty Grew had noted the strength of the cultural tradition, of egalitarian individualism in Punjab, with personal friendships and enmities playing a significant role in episodes of violence. Many outside writers in fact scoff at the military titles used by Sikh militants, believing they are trying to claim a dignity and power they do not have. The self-proclaimed general, the so-called lieutenant, and so forth. I think, rather, that we might see these titles as honors, awarded to fighters viewed as especially heroic or gifted, without necessarily treating them as direct analogues of ranks in a state-based military order. A general of the Khalistan Commando Force, doesn't have the controlling power of a general in the Indian Army, but he has a lot more freedom of action. And whatever outsiders may think, the title of general carries as much respect in the Khalistani community as Schwarzkopf or Powell carries in the United States. One of the incidents that won the KCF notoriety in India, was a dramatic rescue in which Manbir Singh Shehiru, alias Harry Singh, and three others, sprang Sukhdev Singh Sukha, also called Lop Singh, from Jalandhar police custody. After General Harry Singh was arrested and disappeared, Lop Singh went on to assume the leadership of the KCF. He had been a member of the police force for 12 years before he turned to militancy. He too, was eventually killed, and his widow and sons fled overseas, where they are now supported by the expatriate militant community. A second major episode in which the KCF was involved, was the assassination of General Vidya, who had led the Indian Armed Forces in Operation Blue Star. The story of his punishment is a dramatic one, involving two young Sikhs, Sukh Jinder Singh and Har Jinder Singh, known affectionately as Sukha and Jinda, who shaved their beards, cut their hair, and infiltrated Vidya's golf club. Some have challenged the suitability of shaving one's beard, but one KCF colleague commented, that if fighters can't give their hair in the guru's service, how will they be able to give their heads? After delivering justice to General Vidya, Sukha and Jinda were able to escape, and remained in hiding for several months. Once captured however, they freely confessed their guilt, and requested the death sentence. When the sentence was handed down, Sukha and Jinda distributed sweets to their fellow jailmates in celebration. They were eventually hanged. The two had, however, written copious essays about their mission in the interim, and these have become staple fare in the militant community. A photo of Sukha and Jinda in jail awaiting their executions, is a common household decoration. The fact that the assassins of General Vidya have already acquired legendary status in the Sikh militant community, is demonstrated by the following story about a seven-year-old boy, who has at this young age, internalized the idea of Sukha and Jinda as heroes. My nephew, he's only seven years old, he used to have dreams about Sukha and Jinda. He would wake up at night crying, saying that he was dreaming they were being hanged. We would say, no, it's okay, go back to sleep. Then in the morning he would tell us that the bad police were killing our people, and we were killing the bad police, and then the bad police arrested Sukha and Jinda, and they were hanging them up. Then I got the chance, he said, I took out my gun and I shot the rope. I shot the rope, he would say, I shot the rope and I saved them. The Babar Khalsa, established at the time of the Narankari episode in 1978, remained independent of the new Panthic committee structure. The Babars were in a way, an outgrowth of the Akhand Kurtney Jothar, with Sukhdev Singh Babar, heading the mainline Babar Khalsa, and Talwinder Singh Parmer, a Canadian, leading an overseas wing called the Babar Khalsa International. 
The Babar Khalsa has always had a slightly different character than the other guerrilla groups, being perceived as very Puritan in religious terms. They do not tolerate compromise on the issue of hair for example, even in the exigencies of guerrilla warfare. The spirituality that permeates the Babars, has led some experts to call them a cult, rather than simply a guerrilla band. Their leader, instead of being called a general, is called a Jatthadar, a term with a more indigenous connotation. One former militant, who was an expert in conducting remote controlled bomb blasts for the Babar Khalsa explained. I always yearned to be a member of the Babar Khalsa. It was a well-reputed organization, and whenever anybody mentioned the word Babar, I had a throb in my heart, thinking, oh God, can I one day be a Babar too? So I always felt proud that in fact I accomplished that goal, that I had found a way to be of service. Looking at my face now, clean-shaven, the way I look, nobody will believe that what I am saying is true. From my old picture and the way I used to live, nobody could believe that I could have so compromised my principles in this alien land. Can anybody imagine that this mild white-collar worker, was at one time bold enough to be a Babar? Nobody here knows me, knows what I am capable of. What a shame it is that we are reduced to living like this. The Babar Khalsa International, was implicated in what was probably the best known episode of the insurgency from the viewpoint of the West. That was the downing of Air India Flight 182, off the coast of Ireland on June 23, 1985, killing 329 people. The flight was bound for London from Toronto, and members of the Canadian Sikh community were immediately suspected, particularly those belonging to the Babar Khalsa International, headed by Talwinder Singh Parmer of Vancouver. The press started calling him Canada's Bindranwala. But after 10 years of investigation, none of the Canadian Babars have in fact been tried for this attack, because of the lack of evidence, and they consistently claim they were not involved. Two journalists from the Toronto Star and Globe and Mail, delved into the case more thoroughly, and found that there were suspicious fragments of evidence pointing not to the Sikhs, but to the Indian government itself. Their book reporting these findings, remains highly controversial. Over the past 10 to 15 years, a few members of the North American Khalistani community, have been involved in domestic episodes of violence, particularly in Canada. Convictions in these matters are far rarer than accusations however, and many suspects continue to have clean police records. Leaders of all the major organizations, are explicitly committed to obeying the laws of the Western countries that host them, and condemn violence here out of hand. It is clear however, that the same Gurdwaras and networks that had been central to the Gadar movement, almost a century before, have been reactivated as foci of the Khalistani militancy today. Fundraising and support for refugees, are two areas in which the expatriates are particularly critical. The other militant organization with a definable international wing, is the Sikh Students Federation, formerly, All India Sikh Students Federation. The federation had been started even before Indian independence, but was revitalized under the leadership of Amrik Singh, Bindranwala's close confederate, and was the avenue through which many militants were eventually recruited into the armed struggle. The Sikh Students Federation, however, also focused on nonviolent means of protest, like holding demonstrations, activities it continues today. Because SSF embraces both violent and nonviolent strategies, it has become a primary actor in the sphere of refugee claims, asylum applicants can be Khalistani activists, without being implicated in violent crimes. The overseas wing of the Sikh Students Federation, is called the International Sikh Youth Federation, which has branches in over a dozen countries. It is particularly strong in Canada. Several North American and European members of ISYF, have gone to Punjab to fight, and a few have been killed there. One Toronto mother explained to me that her son, just out of high school, told her he was going to California to become a trucker. Then she suddenly got the news that he had been martyred in an encounter in Punjab. The Allied Sikh organization in the United States is, Sikh Youth of America, SYA, 
with branches in all major Sikh population centers. Despite their openly militant stance, ISYF and SYA have gained some political credibility in North America, and U.S. and Canadian political figures are regular speakers at their functions. ISYF also publishes a popular newspaper, Chardi Kala, from offices in Surrey, British Columbia. These three groups, KCF, Babar Khalsa, and Sikh Students Federation, were the early major actors in the Khalistani insurgency. In the beginning, the KCF and the Sikh Students Federation worked together under the authority of the Panthic Committee, while the Babar Khalsa chose to remain independent. There had been a feud between the Babars and Bindranwala's group up until Operation Blue Star, and this rift continued during the formation of the Panthic Committee. In May 1988, however, just two years after the declaration of Khalistan, another army action against the Golden Temple complex prompted a dramatic reorganization of militant groups. Operation Black Thunder II, as this second assault was called, was very different from Operation Blue Star. It came upon the heels of the dismissal of the elected state government of Surjit Singh Barnarla, Akali Dal, by the central government in the previous year. During 1987 and 1988, it became clear that the government was organizing hit squads to go after the militants, entirely outside of the police and judicial apparatus, and there are hints that the functioning of these squads was approved at the highest levels. In addition, Sushil Money, a Jain monk who had been working as an intermediary between the government and the militants, said outright that the government itself was fomenting terrorism in Punjab, and there were individuals in high positions in the government who said so too. The militants themselves realized that there were other actors on the scene, and that the level of infiltration into various organizations was escalating. When the Golden Temple complex came under attack for the second time, it was not clear just who the real militants were, and who were in some way working for the government. Guns had been brought inside the complex, despite the fact that it was under close military guard, leading some observers to question the independence of the militants who were inside. This time, the attack did not take the form of an all-out military assault, as in Operation Blue Star, but was a picking off of militants one by one with highly accurate sniper fire. When the militants' forces started being decimated in this way, the rest of those inside came out with hands up, 192 surrenders, according to Director General of Police, K.P.S. Gill. The surrender of the militants provided a media coup for the Indian government, and Operation Black Thunder II was hailed as an enormous success. The theatrical quality of the incident however, and the doubts surrounding government involvement in militant organizations at the time, make it difficult to assess just what the outcome of Black Thunder II was, in terms of its actual effectiveness in curbing terrorism. What did happen however, was that infighting broke out at unprecedented levels among the militants, one group accusing the other of being in some way, associated with a government attempt to sabotage the Khalistan movement. The reorganization of the Panthic Committee subsequent to Operation Black Thunder II is read differently by people in various factions today. The bare facts of the matter are that after the shakeup, there were three separate Panthic Committees, all claiming to speak for the movement. Gobachan Singh Mano Chal, the first among equals, head of the original Panthic Committee, formed his own committee as well as gathering a guerrilla force, the Bindranwala Tiger Force of Khalistan, BTFK, to support it. After Mano Chal's martyrdom, this committee and its force seemed to have evaporated or been reincorporated into other groups. Wasan Singh Zafarwal, likewise, maintained his own Panthic Committee, the Zafarwal Panthic Committee, and kept part of the Khalistan Commando Force with him, the KCF Zafar Wall. Dr. Sohan Singh, the leader of the group who initiated the challenge to the old Panthic Committee structure, formed what has been called the Second, or Sohan Singh Panthic Committee. This Panthic Committee kept a part of the Khalistan Commando Force, as well as retaining the allegiance of the Sikh Students' Federation. The Babar Khalsa, heretofore independent, joined this Panthic Committee. Its two leaders, were Darwar Singh and Mehel Singh, 
became members of the Panthic Committee itself. And there were two new forces under its control as well, the Khalistan Liberation Force, KLF, which was a kind of coalition of what had been scattered smaller forces, and a faction of the Bindranwala Tiger Force of Khalistan, led by Sukhwinder Singh Sunga, BTFK Sunga. While the Zafar Wal group retained the aura of legitimacy, stemming from Wasan Singh Zafar Wal's appointment to the original Panthic Committee through the Sarbat Khalsa, the usurpers under Dr. Sohan Singh, quickly gained a great deal of military power. The increased involvement of Pakistan at this point is undeniable. Though the role of Pakistan in the Khalistani insurgency, is typically overstated by Indian government apologists, in the form of blaming Pakistan for the alienation of the Sikhs, it is clear that once the alienation was present, Pakistan enabled its expression through the provision of weapons, training, and an exile base for militant leaders. The Sohan Singh, or Second Panthic Committee, in any case ended up being the more militarily powerful, while the Zafar Wal Panthic Committee continued to have a substantial political voice, due to its continuity with the original Panthic Committee. It is important to note here, that Satinder Pal Singh, based in Canada, was a member of the Sohan Singh Panthic Committee, and Jagjit Singh Chauhan, based in England, was a member of the Zafar Wal Panthic Committee. International Sikhs were therefore as tied up in Panthic Committee politics, as those on the ground in Punjab. There are at least two major ways of interpreting what happened during the 1988 Panthic reorganization. From the point of view of the Zafar Wal group, the Sohan Singh contingent, literally undermined the legitimate struggle for Khalistan, wittingly or unwittingly aiding the government of India in this regard. Some at least are accused outright, of being agents of the Indian government. They had a great many weapons, and committed atrocities that discredited the movement, and the Babar Khalsa in particular, is described in this perspective as being composed of fundamentalists, who alienated the population of Punjab with their strict regimen. Rather than dignifying those adhering to the Sohan Singh group as a Panthic committee, people associated with the Zafar Wal perspective, typically refer to this group as simply, Charja Jaru, Jatabandi, the four fighting groups, later to become, Panchja Jaru, Jatabandi, five fighting groups. The Zafar Wal Panthic Committee, is represented outside of India by the Council of Khalistan, based in London, and Wasan Singh Zafar Wal himself, continues to lead the KCF Zafar Wal. From the Sohan Singh or Second Panthic Committee perspective, they and their forces are the main inheritors of the legacy of the original Panthic Committee, with the Zafar Wal group, a spin-off that has some political, but little military clout. It should be noted that the US State Department, while not commenting on who is, or is not the legitimate heir to the original leadership of the Khalistan movement, or who is, or is not an agent of the Indian government, believes that the Second Panthic Committee is the most powerful. One thing that is clear to everybody involved in the Khalistani militancy, is that there are way too many factions and groups, and way too much in fighting. Joyce Pettigrew is absolutely correct, in noting that the multiplicity of groups in the post-1988 period, along with the widespread availability of weapons, led to a situation of chaos in which many abuses occurred, and infiltration was hard to monitor, eventually alienating many of Punjab's villagers from the militancy. Nearly every militant with whom I have spoken, agrees with this assessment, and recognizes that international credibility will hinge at least partly, on the development of a more unified organization. Some say the movement will have to become more selective, both in recruitment and in military strategy. The time for angry outbursts is over, one said. Now we have to settle down for the long haul. Since 1988, there have been some further developments in the Second Panthic Committee. The Babar Khalsa left the group once more, to take up an independent existence, and a rift developed between the KCF and the KLF, which resulted in the departure of the former in 1993. Dr. Sohan Singh, the founder of the Second Panthic Committee, also split away from the others, and was captured and held in custody in India until early 1996. Dr. Pritam Singh Sikhan, head of the KLF, Daljit Singh Bido, 
head of the SSF, and Satinder Pal Singh of Canada, formed the core then, of a second Panthic committee. It is this modified second Panthic committee that Dr. Amarjit Singh, critical to my initial entree to the community, represents. Today the Babar Khalsa, under the continuing leadership of Wardawa Singh and Mehel Singh, is operating totally independently of any Panthic committee structure, as is the Khalistan Commando Force under Parmjit Singh Panjwar, KCF Panjwar. There are radical differences of views as to where the real locus of power now lies. Some interlocutors suggest that these two independent forces, are in fact the major actors in the militancy, as of the spring of 1996, and discount talk of Panthic committees as political rhetoric, rather than realistic description of the movement. Reconciling the divergent accounts of the current status of the militancy, primarily divisible into the Zafar Wal Panthic Committee view, the Second Panthic Committee view, and a decentralized perspective, is probably impossible for an observer, seeking to remain aloof from internecine quarrels. Certainly, to seek the kinds of information that would allow one to assess which forces are more or less powerful, speaks more to intelligence gathering, than to anthropology, I never ask questions like, how many militants does Panjwar command, or what kinds of weapons does the KLF have access to. I therefore don't know about the relative strengths of the KCF Panjwar or the KLF, what I do know is that there are several views of the Sikh militancy today, and each appears to have a substantial following. For the purposes of activism on nonviolent and democratic fronts overseas, a lot of these schisms and discrepancies are blurred over. In fact, despite the emphasis on those taking up arms for Khalistan in this book, there are many more Khalistanis who advocate it through peaceful means, particular in Western countries where such expression is tolerated. The World Sikh Organization for example, established by Major General Jaswant Singh Bolar and others, at Madison Square Garden, New York, in 1984, is a respected cultural and political organization for North American Sikhs, that supports the movement for Khalistan through democratic means only. WSO, has also become involved in local political issues involving the Sikh community, like the wearing of turbans in the RCMP in Canada, the carrying of kirpans in schools, and so on. Its members are mainstream and generally moderate Sikhs, some of whom condemn the armed militancy, others of whom give passive support to it, and many who simply focus their own attentions elsewhere. Dr. Gurmeet Singh Olak, is president of the Council of Khalistan in Washington, D.C., another important organization in the expatriate Sikh community. The Council of Khalistan was established by the First Panthic Committee on October 10, 1987, and Dr. Olak was named at that time to head the movement for Khalistan internationally. He has been particularly effective in reaching many members of the U.S. Congress, as well as other important political figures. There are periodic letters to U.S. presidents on behalf of human rights for Sikhs, and self-determination for Khalistan, often signed by 20 or 30 members of Congress, organized primarily by Dr. Alak. There is a House resolution, explicitly calling for self-determination for Khalistan. An independent bilingual newspaper, the World Sikh News, reaches many North American Sikhs from its press in Stockton, California previously a center of the Gadar movement. Punjab-based human rights organizations, such as the International Human Rights Organization, also have branches in North America. In many universities of the United States and Canada, Sikh students have organized into formal associations, and periodically hold forums on human rights and political issues. Many Gurdwaras are also quite active in these spheres. An open letter to the United Nations Secretary General, was placed in the New York Times on the 10-year anniversary of Operation Blue Star, co-sponsored by 12 major Gurdwaras, and an even larger number of Gurdwaras came together to protest the September 1995 disappearance of human rights activist, Jaswant Singh Kalra. These initiatives were coordinated by the Khalistan Affairs Center, run by Dr. Amarjit Singh. The Akali Dal party of Simranjit Singh Man, longtime leader of Khalistani politics in India, raises money abroad, on a regular basis. 
there are several alleged militants in prisons in the United States and Canada, and extradition issues are a focus of activism, on the part of the expatriate community. Two of the best-known prisoners, Ranjit Singh Gill and Sukhminder Singh Sandhu, known affectionately as Kuki and Suki, have been in jail in New York for more than eight years. Kulbir Singh, now in a Nevada facility, has also generated a great deal of interest, as have Daya Singh Lahoria and his wife, Kamal Jitkor, in Texas. There is a Canadian extradition case related to the Longo Wall assassination, that is mobilizing the Sikh community there as well. It is vividly clear then, that the idea of an independent nation of Khalistan, evokes substantial support among diaspora Sikhs, a fact that I consider more carefully in the penultimate chapter of this book. Though today there are indications that support for Khalistan may have waned in Punjab itself, Petty Gros' account brings out the widespread quality of support for the Khalistan movement during its peak years, which reached deeply into nearly all sectors of Punjabi society. This support is the most important counter to the claim of extremism and terrorism made exhaustively by the Indian government, the mainstream media, and many academics. One may approve, disapprove, or remain non-committal, but it is very clear to those who have actually worked with people in the Khalistani community, that it was not, and is not, a peripheral movement. Still today, despite the disillusionment of many with the way the militant Khalistanis have functioned, new recruits come forward to join the guerrilla forces. One leader told me, that he in fact has to dissuade over eager youngsters, whose fervor may exceed their abilities to actually make a fruitful contribution. Despite the claims of the Indian government, the Sikh militancy has not, in fact, been eradicated, despite massive counter-terrorism efforts over the past dozen years. Rather, it has simply spread out around the globe. For good or ill, India has not seen the last of Sikh separatists. In 1992, elections were held in Punjab, and they are sometimes heralded as evidence that the population supported the crackdown against the militants, as Congress party candidates swept the polls. This interpretation would be misleading, since these candidates were elected by an extraordinarily low voter turnout, of around 21% of the population, some estimates are lower. Militant groups had been urging the boycott of the elections, so as to deny legitimacy to Indian rule, and there was extensive support for this boycott. There were reports of militants stopping people from journeying to polling places, but there were also reports of police and army personnel, forcing people to vote at gunpoint. The outcome was that although India claimed in 1992, that democracy continued to function in Punjab, the electorate was in fact being ruled by people, chosen by a small minority of the population. The chief minister of Punjab who came to power through these elections, B. Ant Singh, was assassinated in the fall of 1995 in a suicide car bombing, believed to have been carried out by the Babar Khalsa. No one has a crystal ball, but it does appear that the Khalistani militancy will take a somewhat different form in the future, from what we have seen over the past decade and half. In addition to a tighter, probably smaller, and more rationally strategic organization, it is likely to be more explicitly international in scope. Current leaders of all factions, are especially interested in allying the Khalistan cause, with those of others protesting the centralized state of India, including most prominently, Kashmiri Muslim separatists, but also extending to tribals in the northeast, and to Dalits, the untouchables, throughout the subcontinent. This kind of cross-regional and cross-community solidarity would be, of course, particularly threatening for Delhi. How all of this would play amongst the populace of Punjab, now apparently weary after 15 years of violence, remains a question. Structuring Militancy at Home and Abroad The fact that a member of the Panthic Committee that declared the independence of Khalistan is now residing in the United States, and that one of the initial instigators of the idea of Khalistan resides in London, Jagjit Singh Chauhan, shows the international character of the Sikh militant movement. 
Diaspora Sikhs have in fact been critical to the movement, and have become more so as the success of the counterinsurgency within Punjab becomes firmly established. This aspect of Sikh militancy creates both opportunities and difficulties for the researcher. Opportunities, because there is a community outside of India accessible to investigation, and living in conditions in which free exchange is possible. Difficulties however, because the transnational quality of Sikh militancy means that US, Canadian, and British citizens and residents, may have been involved in very serious criminal activities abroad, and contact with them, puts the researcher at least in the margins of these activities as well. There are security and intelligence questions here, not only from the viewpoint of India, but from the viewpoint of the Western countries that host diaspora Sikhs as well. A more immediate problem to be faced however, concerns the extreme factionalization of the militant community. Up until this chapter, I have basically Banochal was de facto head of the new Panthic committee, it was conceived as a democratic committee of equals, in the Panch Piaris tradition. On April 29, 1986, the Panthic Committee called a press conference at the Golden Temple Complex, and presented the Declaration of Independence of Khalistan. It is a rather loosely written document, but it includes basic guarantees of democracy in the proposed state of Khalistan, as well as running through the litany of abuses suffered by Sikhs in the Indian state. All five members of the Panthic Committee were wanted by police at the time, so while the assembled journalists at the press conference were being served tea, the five members of the Panthic Committee changed into street clothes, and made their escape. The next day, the Golden Temple complex was invaded for the second time by Indian Army commandos, in an operation referred to as, Operation Black Thunder 1. Many Sikhs saw this as an attempt to justify the original Operation Blue Star, and the ruling Akali party led by Surjit Singh Barnala, was split by the issue. Many party members resigned in protest, and Barnarla himself was declared Tankaya, or excommunicated by the Akal Takht, for his role in allowing this second sacrilege to happen. The Panthic committee members remained in hiding after their initial pronouncement of Khalistan, participating in various elements of what was evolving in Sikh theorists of guerrilla warfare agree, that an insurgent army simply cannot survive without substantial support from the general population. The guerrilla among his people like a fish in the water, and so on. Though the activists in the Sikh militancy are generally quite unaware, either of theories about guerrilla warfare, or of other guerrilla movements, with the exception of Kashmir, linked historically and strategically to the Punjab question, one interlocutor noted specifically the impact of Che Guevara on his thinking. I will tell you about my friend, who was always a very polite boy, who never fought with anybody or did anything wrong. He was a good student. After the Golden Temple event, he went into the movement. His family got upset and they were telling him to come home, as he was the only son. But he said, when you used to read in the paper about how brave the other boys were, you used to praise them, but now when it comes to your own house you start crying. I won't come home. Consider me as dead. The first action he got involved in was a very big action, in which eight police officers at a detective training academy were killed. The first gun he ever shot was an AK-47 in that raid. He and his comrades also pulled off an immense bank robbery, and a lot of the money was in his hands. But he didn't misuse a penny of it. He became in fact very pie to a full-blown guerrilla operation, until they were arrested, killed, or forced to flee the country. None of the members of the original Panthic Committee are alive in India today, three were killed and the other two now live in other countries. The Declaration of Independence of Khalistan, cites the Khalistan Commando Force, under the leadership of General Harry Singh, an alias of Bhai Manbir Singh Shahiru, after a Sikh hero of the Afghan wars, as the core of the Defence Force of Khalistan. The Khalistan Commando Force, KCF, was one of a handful of guerrilla organizations that sprang up after Operation Blue Star, a good number of its members being from the Maja region of Punjab, districts Amritsar and Gurdaspur. The Maja region, northeast of the Bias River, was historically known for its fierce and stubborn fighters. 
it is the site of Sikhism's holiest shrine, and is located on the Grand Trunk Road to Delhi. Flat and treeless like most of Punjab, the Majar Zone is not an ideal setting for a guerrilla insurgency. From the beginning, militants who joined the Khalistan Commando Force, depended upon shelter from the people. The fact that Sikh militant organizations, have been able to sustain themselves in a territory as unsuited to insurgency as Punjab, has not received the attention it deserves. Although it is clear that shelter was sometimes given at gunpoint, all the clad in discussing the Sikh militancy as a unitary entity, however split up functionally into various forces and organizations. Alas for the movement, this picture is false. Infighting is in fact as characteristic of this movement, as is a certain external solidarity. Rifts between groups are expressed not only in vehement verbal arguments, but in physical disagreements, ranging from fist fights to shooting incidents. At the worst, they accuse each other of being agents of the Indian government, a serious charge indeed in a national liberation movement. This infighting discourages, not only temporary insiders like inquisitive anthropologists, but also seasoned Khalistani Sikhs. They all lament the state of affairs, but seem powerless to do anything about it. The original Panthic Committee, of which Dana Singh was a member, also included, Babagobachan Singh Mano Chal, by Wasan Singh Zafar Wal, by Arur Singh, and by Gurdaf Singh Usman Wala. They were connected to the Damdami Taksal and were Orthodox Sikhs. After a Sarbat Khalsa, summoned by the Damdami Taksal on January 26, 1986, and conceived as a gathering of the entire community or Panth of Sikhs, these five were chosen to lead the struggle, that had in fact already begun during the months after the assassination of Indira Gandhi. Although 